that part. But there was one more thing I wanted to show you on forms apps before we move on to the next thing. Since you asked me how to make an exit, um, let's change our button so it actually says exit. And the way to do that would be and or e ampersand x i t. That way we follow convention. So that would mean alt x would trigger the button. So it doesn't the ampersand doesn't have to come at the front. It can come anywhere and indicate any of the letters. One of the things you got to watch out for when you do this though is that you don't double up, right? So you don't want to have two things called X, like control X would be cut, right? <laughs> you don't want to have two things in there. Now control X and alt X are obviously different things, but you don't want to have two things in there with the same key combination. Okay, the other thing that I wanted to show you how to do, since it's completely fascinating, is how to create a menu across the top. So just type in menu at the top in your toolbox, and I'll drag the menu strip over, and I can drop it anywhere. It's going to go where it's supposed to. It's going to go right there at the top. Now you'll notice when I did that, two things happened. I got a menu strip here, but I also got a menu strip down here. So this is what you pick when you want to change the properties. If I click on it down here, it's going to select the menu strip. And as usual, I should name this something. And making a menu is super easy. So we do file now. We want to do and file, right? So that the thing is there. The little shortcut. So what if you actually wanted an empty sand inside? You do it twice. Okay. Like so. <clears throat> And then you could do all the normal stuff, open, which really should be ampersand O. Okay, so that's pretty nice. You can also right click in here. I think you can. Nope, you can't. You just click this little thing right here. U speed, right click. I guess they changed it. So, what I want to do in here, you can do different things. Menu item is the default, but you could also have a text box or a combo box, which would be weird, but you can do it. And then the separator is something that you need to know about. So we'll click that, it'll give us a nice separator, and we'll do exit here. Now that doesn't double up because Alt X will trigger the button, Alt FX will trigger the menu. So now when we run this, We've got a menu at the top. And we can click on them and nothing will happen. Um, um is the universal symbol for it didn't work. <laughs> the universal expression of it didn't work. Okay, so that's menu. There's other things that you can put in here too, the stuff that you're usually going to put in here, and we're not going to go over this in great detail, but we can put a tool strip up here, and now you've got your classic menu bar, right? So you can add buttons, labels, so it will look like this right here is the menu bar for Visual Studio. And you can add icons to it, and so forth. So now we've got our menu, we've got our icon bar, and then the other thing, this window doesn't have one, but there's usually a status strip down at the bottom. So if we do a status strip, 
Drop that in there and you'll recognize that one as well. And you can have different things down there at the bottom. So this is just in a nutshell how to very quickly make an application for Windows. So there's one more thing I want to show you and then we'll move on to the next kind of program. And that is, we, I told you earlier, we had this uh, thing set up where we double-click the button. It kind of makes an assumption that you're going to want the click if you're clicking a button. And Visual Studio will always do its best to figure out what it thinks you want. And it's usually going to default to click, but it doesn't always. So if I double-click this, it's going to take me to click. Well, that's not the only event that I can respond to. Let me go back to my designer. And I'm going to click on the text field that we created earlier. And I'm going to come down over here. Let me zoom in on this so we can see it. We've been dealing with the properties, and we can change the property display to categorized or alphabetized. I usually leave it on alphabetized. Um, but we can also use these two buttons to change what's displayed here. Right now, it's showing you the properties, and the giveaway in Visual Studio for properties is a little wrench. So anytime you see a wrench, that's a property. Events are the lightning bolts. So we click that and now we can see all the events that are available to us. So if I can line this up correctly, we'll see if we scroll around that we have nothing in here, but all of the different events are here. So click is right here. Let's change, let's find one that will respond to the text changing. I think it's value changed, text align changed. Do you see it? I can't see it because I'm zoomed in. There we go. Okay, so find text changed. Now at this point, you can type a method name in here if you've already created one, but if you haven't, you can just double click and it will make one for you. And that's usually what you do. So it created that event for you and it went ahead and wired it up. So why don't we add something in here like LBL message. Remember we have that message down at the bottom. Might as well just play with that a little bit more. Dot text equals. And we'll just set it to whatever you're typing up top will appear down below. And that's how you set up your own event if you would like to do that, and at some point I'm certain that you will. We'll give it a try. Ooh, I wonder why I didn't, oh, because it's still, it's not visible, right? So we have to make it visible. Let's try it again. Hopefully this time it'll work. Okay, not bad. <coughs> All right, so pretty much any user interface element that you've ever seen is probably available to you over here but there are several thousand other options that are available to you. There are third-party controls that you can go purchase or get for free, depending on what kind it is and who makes it. I'll give you an example. I do. I never use this company, but they're the first one. Oh, let's, let's use one that I actually use. I don't like Telerik. Um, I use Sync Fusion quite a bit. Actually, this is a good one to go to because they just released Community Edition, so you can use all of their stuff for free, which is awesome. Um, their stuff usually costs around 10 grand if you buy everything, so it's not cheap. But their community edition matches Visual Studio's community edition. So if you're a small team, fewer than five people, less than a million dollars a year in revenue, you can use their stuff for free. Oh, so community isn't just a. You can actually sell stuff as long as it's you can. More than yes, you can. And with Visual Studio, that's also true. And that includes also licenses. Yes. 
<laughs> they want you. They want startups to to happen, and they want startups to happen on their platform. You have other options, right? You can do everything in Java completely free, regardless of how big your team is. So that's that's a draw for Java. I think you'll find yourself far more productive using the Microsoft tools because they've spent a lot of time and money making them awesome. Now, that said, so have some of the other companies. Um, Oracle and IBM have poured a ton of money into their tools. If you've used Eclipse, that's backed by IBM, and it always has been. It was created at IBM. It wasn't a, a group of hackers in a garage making that. IBM came up with that as their general purpose IDE. And then Oracle inherited from Sun. They got their jet, their what do they call it? NetBeans IDE for Java. The very best Java IDE isn't free. It's, in my opinion, it's JetBrains. So it's called IntelliJ IDEA. It's not ex incredibly expensive. I think uh, their licensing structure is set up so that if you're an individual developer, I think it's $99. I could be wrong, but it's in that ballpark. And if you're a corporate developer, if you've got a bunch of people, then it's $300 a copy. So it doesn't go up a lot. Um, it may go up as high. No, I don't, I don't remember. I'm not a salesman, so I don't have to know the price. But it's in that ballpark. But this is an awesome set of tools. And if you go look at it, all of their tools are available on all the platforms. So if you make something for the web, you can turn around and use almost the same controls. Make the Windows Form app, Windows Presentation Framework, which I'll show you in just a minute. You can also do the mobile stuff. So all the mobile stuff is here, and we'll talk about mobile in just a minute. The other thing that's really handy is they have these file formatters for you. So you can read and write Excel files, you can read and write Word files, you can read and write PDF files. I use these quite a bit in my applications. And then if you're going to go buzzwordy, um, then you can get into the big data platform and predictive analytics, and now we're completely out of the realm of multimedia and game programming. Um, but these are the big fields that people are going to want the jobs in, you know, coming in the coming year and going forward. Mainly because the marketing people are into this, and marketing people have deep pockets. So you can go, you can go work for a marketing company. You probably should. They they will pay you a lot of money. <laughs> Okay, so if you want some of this stuff, you all you have to do to get the community license is just click on it. And you click, cl you don't have to give a credit card or anything. You just click claim free license. You sign up. They send it to you. It's that simple. Um, I used to pay for this, and then this, this is new. This community edition just came out in January. And so this is brand new. Um, and I'm totally psyched about this because I had the, uh, the web version, and I want to make some Windows Forms app and some, some other things. <laughs> I was like, wow, I can't afford this. Um, but now it's moot. Uh, the other thing that's great about this, and I'm glad, I'm really glad I came here, you should sign up because there's two other things in here that are useful. So let me sign in real quick, and I'll show you what they are. Um, if you tweet, you get entered into a contest to win a cool prize. I think it's a smart watch or something like that. Uh, let me see. And it's a bit buried. Okay. Come over here to ebooks. And they're publishing all of these books. So what they're doing is they're paying industry experts to go out and write these books. It's called the Succinctly series. And what this is is topics that developers care about, new and emerging technologies in a hundred pages or fewer. So all these books are designed to be short so that you can get everything you need and there's stuff in here that you guys need. I, I've mentioned CUDA, well that was probably the other class, um, but there's CUDA programming which is how to access your video card. Um, I thought about showing you that and saying, ha ha, I was right, they bought Unity and seeing you guys freak out. But <laughs> <laughs> that's not what that means, that's something else. <laughs> Coincidence, right? <laughs> Uh, Linux, okay, big deal. If you go down here, you'll, you're going to start seeing things that are useful to you. There's there's a thing on machine learning. Yeah. Okay, so how cool is that? Regular expressions. If you haven't been to hell yet, <laughs> read this book, and you'll understand what hell really is. At church, we say it's a place devoid of God's love. Here we say 
its regular expressions. Uh, localization, you want your stuff to run in multiple languages. PowerShell, that's not a bad thing to learn. You want to learn Android? There it is. It's, I mean, there's tons of stuff here. Wait, did you say Entity Framework? Yes, Entity Framework is in there. You should never use Entity Framework because it's a piece of junk. Oh. <laughs> it's complete junk. Now, I say that, you should learn it because it will get you a job, but if you're writing your own stuff, you should ignore Entity Framework because it's ridiculous. Um, a caveat that I usually share with my students is that anything that Microsoft generates is probably a bad thing. The only exception to that rule is your user interface. It generated this. Okay, you really can't get away from that. But Entity Framework will generate all of your classes, all of your database tables for you. And it's designed to make your coding life easier, right? Um, let me see if I can remember. I will have to remember what this is, but there's a, oh, it's service stack that has it. They have a book on Service Stack, but the reason why I'm going to Service Stack is Service Stack has an ORM in it with, which I don't really care about. <laughs> which is just fun, right? Let's see, where's the micro ORM? Oh, that's not what I wanted. They have a slide in here somewhere that shows the performance breakdown of what the different things are. And of course their ORM runs super fast and Microsoft's Entity Framework is super slow. It's like the slowest one. And then over on the right, or on the left, on the far left of the graph, it's code by hand and it's the fastest one. <laughs> and coding in hand is not that coding by hand is not that big a deal. It's not that hard. So if you're into the corporate development stuff, um, I would think you would want to go design your own database instead of having Microsoft generate it from your classes. That's usually a mistake anyway. Because that implies your class structures are two-dimensional like a database, and they shouldn't be. They should be richer than that, which is a nice segue into what we're going to be doing in a few minutes. Okay, so this is your forms app. Why don't we take a look at another kind of application? I'm going to roll these up to sort of get them out of the way. Before you post that, is uh -huh. it possible to get rid of that ugly Windows bar at the top of Windows Forms? This one? Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> but I'm trying to remember how you do it because it's not a simple thing. I think you basically have to turn everything off. So if you get rid of the text... I'll give it a quick stab and see if I can see if I can pull it off. But I have done it before, so I know you can do it. Then there's the buttons, and that's usually cancel button is none. Okay, that's fine. Oops. Context menu control box. Here it is. Turn the control box off, and that will probably do it. Of course, now you got no way to move it. <laughs> but that's not to say that you can't implement something that will move it, because there are libraries designed to help you do this, to make an application that doesn't have the ugly Windows thing at the top. So I'm going to turn that back on, because that's disconcerting to me. <laughs> OK, let's do the next kind, unless there are any other questions. I actually have a question, but it's not about that. Oh, OK. Um, when you create a free account on SyncFusion, mm -hmm. what would we put for company name? Whatever you want. Just anything? Make one up. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're a select. <laughs> Incorporated. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people that think I work for a company called Hired Gun Incorporated. <laughs> <laughs> What's fun about that is if you do that, if you, if you use something different every time, you can tell who's giving your email address away and who doesn't. It'll say... Hello, Bruce Van Horn from Hired Gun. Well, let me see. I typed that in at Apple and over at Sync Fusion, so they <laughs> obviously sold their list. So who do I bother about this? Nice. Yeah, you'd have to remember. All of the places, the way you 
that's the problem with lies, right? You have to remember them all in order exactly. to perpetuate them. It's kind of like uh, passwords. <laughs> okay, what was I doing? Oh, okay, we're going to add a new one. This one will just take a few minutes. I'm going to say add new project, and I've right-clicked on solution. So right-click on solution, add new project. And this time I'm going to do a WPF application. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because you have entire chapter on this in your book. But I'm assuming none of you have read it yet, so why don't we just cut to the chase. <laughs> so this is the same thing that we just did, just in a different format. So Windows presentation format is, um, if you remember what we looked at a minute ago, our code, it's actually still open, we can, I can go flip over and show it to you designer code, so this is C-sharp code. If we go over here and look at this one, this is the code for it down here, and it's not C-sharp code, is it? What is that? XML. That's XAML, but more specifically, it's or less specifically, it's XML. XML is just a, a markup language, you know, just a generic one. And it happens that XAML is XML compliant. Really, XML is just a set of rules. It's not a language unto itself, in spite of the L <laughs> that stands for language. Okay, so this is the same thing, it's just newer. So the Windows presentation framework, uh, they attempted to usurp Flash, is what they really did here. And by Flash, what I really probably mean is Flex. Flex and Flash are ostensibly the same thing. Flex allows you to develop user interfaces and programs using ActionScript and a designer not unlike this one. Um, Flash, on the other hand, you can do all the same stuff, but you have all these animation tools for making multimedia presentations that don't exist in Flex, although you can, of course, bring movie clips created in Flash into Flex and get the best of both worlds. Like a big mess. Yeah, it is a big mess. <laughs> um, and it was very popular for a long time. What really killed it was tablets, obviously. So Flex has this, old, this whole infrastructure where you can create applications for Windows, Linux, and Mac. And you can use ActionScript, which is a pretty good language. It's just as good as, it's like JavaScript, but strongly typed. That's the, the biggest difference. It's exactly like Unity JavaScript in every way, shape, and form. They should have just called it ActionScript and called it a day. I think how jQuery was written, they based it somewhat of ActionScript because it's really similar. Yeah, it was, and like it was, it's a good language. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was good stuff. So anyway, this is all vector-based graphics is what it's creating for you. So things are going to scale a little bit nicer and the fonts are going to be a little bit smoother. But other than that, it's the same thing. So we'll just throw a button out there and we'll throw a text box out there. There aren't as many controls. You might have noticed that right away. There's just this many. So it isn't as rich a programming environment, but it is designed to be more of a responsive environment. Those of you that are web guys know what I'm talking about. So this means that it's going to resize things automatically. And you can see that the layout is a little bit different. So we've got some springies going on here. Looks a lot like the Mac, to be honest with you. And uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time doing this stuff because A, I don't do very much of it, and I'm certainly not an expert in this particular framework. So I don't want to pretend that I am. And secondly, um, you're not going to use it very much unless you're making, there's two kinds of applications you can make with this. You can make a Metro application, which will cause everyone to hate you. Or you can make a Windows Phone application, which are ostensibly the same thing, just different platforms, right? So the WPF application or the WPF framework is what's used in Windows Store applications and Metro applications. So wouldn't it just be better to use the Windows Store application? Yes, but that only works if you have Windows 8 installed. So we can't do that on these computers. Um, Windows Store is also going to add some things in there that you may not want or need. So it's going to add in... Oh, um, the Yeah, it's going to add in all the stuff that they expect to have in there. And that's a good thing or a bad thing. It just depends on what you want to do. If you don't need that stuff, if you're just making a program for you, 
then you don't need that. If you're going to sell it, obviously, yeah, go for the store app because it's going to have all the compliance stuff built into it. So when you submit something to any of the app stores, except for, you know, I don't know what the process is for Microsoft. I've never done it on Microsoft, but the other two, Android and, and um, Apple, Apple has a really rigorous process where if somebody actually runs your app and reviews it and makes sure it's not stupid and make sure it doesn't violate their rules and make sure it's not porn and make sure it's not, you know, all, their, all the little rules that they have, they make sure that all that's in place. Android is the wild, wild west. You can publish any dang thing you want to on Android and nobody will stop you. Unless it's just really, really offensive and enough people complain, um, then your app get, might get taken down. But um, there is no vetting process on Android. In Microsoft, I'm pretty sure they do vet. But I could be wrong. I've, I've never published there before. When you get the developer's license, it gives you a whole list of everything. Yeah, I'm sure. But I don't know if they have someone actually eyeballing it to see if it's... Apple is the most strict. So they even have really strict rules on what kinds of applications and how your application is compiled matters to them too. They don't allow any sort of runtime which is why Flash will never happen on the iPhone. Okay, so this is pretty much the same thing. It's just slightly different modality, right? So you've got all these little controls just like you had before. You drag them around, put them where you want them. Um, you have to name them just like you did before. The name is in a different place. It's up here, and it comes in as no name, which I think is even worse than auto-naming it. So you want to make sure that you name them. And beyond that, it's not that different. Um, a few things are going to be different, like on the text box. Instead of .text, it's going to be down in here somewhere else. Oh, I could be wrong. Maybe it is in here. I don't think it is, though. That's the layout and what's in there. I think it's content, if memory serves. Oh, nope, there it is. Common text text box. Yeah. Yeah, it supports multiple undos. If you don't want that, then you can turn it off. So if you change it, you can undo it up to 100 times. Um, double click, just like before, will get you the events. If you want to do it directly, you can come over here and switch to the little lightning bolt. Again, your clues, properties are always wrenches. Let me zoom in. Properties are always wrenches. Events are always lightning bolts in this particular IDE. And then if you just double click, it will generate it for you. And now you're back in regular C sharp mode and you're writing C sharp code. So the only difference between these two things is how the interface is rendered and how it's specified. So the, the interface itself is all of its positioning and whatnot is done through the XAML? That's right. Okay, so that's WPF. Let's take a look at a web application. Now, we don't have a ton of time to teach web application development in here. There are other fine classes here at Richland, but since we're taking a tour of all the things you can make in Visual Studio, why don't we look at most of the big ones? So I'm going to say New Project. And I'm going to come over here to Visual C Sharp. I'm going to find Web. And there's only one thing there, but I do want to draw your attention to this. If you open this up, you have the options that were present in Visual Studio 2012, which are not terribly different than the ones that you're going to get up here. So you've got all these named out. So you've got empty, empty web application, web forms. That's an old way of doing it. If you can envision a Windows Forms application like we made earlier existing on the web, then that's what you have here. It looks exactly the same. It works exactly the same way. But people don't use it anymore because of postbacks. Um, so these applications are very slow. Every time something changes on the screen, it has to make a round trip back to the server 
and nobody develops that way anymore except for the United States military. <laughs> I think they're just now upgrading to Windows XP though, so it's fine. Um, there are different kinds of applications, and since it's 2012, some of these are going to be out of date. For example, ASP.NET MVC4. MVC is an acronym. It stands for Model View Controller, which is a pattern, um, which is not terribly important to know unless you're doing web development. But that's what that's, what that's coming from. 4 is not the current version. There's, there's a version 5 out, so probably if you're doing a new application, you would probably want to go with 5. So this one's pretty much a no-go unless you're developing for something super old, um, but it is really easy. So if you just want to make something simple for yourself, then that's a good way to go. Yeah, but users are really expecting things to be zippy and faster, and internet speeds are getting faster, but devices are getting slower. So we've got our cool, you know, at MacBook Air here with the fast internet connection, but if you're running a Windows RT platform, which is on their ARM processor, yeah, it's not going to be zippy at all. <laughs> so you really want to maximize things so that they go fast, and that means doing everything on the client that you can. Yeah, it's, it's ugly. <laughs> it is fun to play with, though, so I encourage you to do that outside of class. Okay, I'm going to go back up to web so we can look at the modern one. And I'll call it Pancake Web, since everything else is pancake. And now I can choose what kind of application I want to make. So ranging from empty, which gives you pretty much nothing, if you select this, all you're going to get is um, a config file and maybe an HTML file if you're lucky, and the um, application, the, the properties file that we always get. Okay, web forms, so you're starting to see the similarity, right? So web forms gives you a web forms application. MVC, they're not locked to a number this time. So that's usually what you're going to pick unless you're doing really modern stuff. If you're doing really modern stuff, you're going to go with a single page application or a web API, and these are kind of different kinds of applications. So this one is really designed if you have lots of different kinds of user interfaces hitting your website. So envision this, you have a front end, and thanks to Obama, everyone knows what a front end and a back end is now, right? <laughs> It flooded the news, right? The back end is screwed up. The front end is screwed up. It's, 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 it was hilarious. People were, you know, you hear secretaries in bars talking about the front end and the back end. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Anyway, this is really um, a, a case where we've got a web service. Just picture a website, but without a web page on it. And you can have an HTML user interface like most applications have, but you can also have an iPad program running that, that executes against this web API. It goes out and makes calls to the server, um, or I guess more near and dear to many of your hearts, you can have Unity post things to a server, and this would be the, the kind of project that you would use for that. So this is designed to be more of a, a headless design where you don't have as much user interface built into this project. If you want a user interface on the web and sort of the whole package, that's MVC. And then a single page application is almost all front end. And then the last one is Azure Mobile, Azure Mobile Service. And that's pretty new. That's on their Azure platform, and that's their cloud infrastructure at Microsoft. So that's probably a bigger topic than we have time to talk about tonight. But we're going to go with, just so we're, so we're looking around, we're going to go with MVC. So this is your basic web application. And you get to pick which stuff you want in here. So do you want it to be MVC, Web API, automatically add unit tests. We'll talk about unit tests another time. Um, 
authentication modes. You can use different authentication modes. It's going to give us one automatically. But let's say we wanted to make an application that allowed you to authenticate through Google or Twitter or Facebook. All of those things are possible by changing the authentication here. And you can have multiples. You can have, you can support all of them. Okay, I'm going to uncheck the host in the cloud button. If I can hit it, there we go. And I'll click OK, and it's going to make more files than you know what to do with. <laughs> didn't say it'd be quick what's actually going on here it's not just creating files it's downloading a lot of dependencies from the internet so when you create something for the web you've got JavaScript usually you have lots of JavaScript libraries involved so if you're into the the web development scene you may have heard of angular you may have heard of bootstrap you may have heard of lots of different frameworks that people are using jQuery everyone's heard of that <clears throat> so it's got to download all this stuff and put it into your application but when it's done this is what you wind up with you've got a full-blown application stub for a web project and you can see all the stuff that it gave you there are lots here <laughs> let's just go ahead and cut to the chase and click start oh wait we forgot to set our project didn't we so we're going to get our forms application after everything builds. Not what we wanted. So let's go fix that. Go back over to Pancake Web, right click it, and set it to the startup project. Okay, now we can come up here and we can, the other visual clue is this changed from run to the default browser. If you have multiples, which I don't right now, this being just a fresh install of Windows, you can pick which one you want this to come up in. So if you had Firefox installed, it would say Firefox in this list or Chrome or whatever. Since I only have Internet Explorer, that's my only choice. So I'm going to pick that begrudgingly. Doesn't matter. Pick one. And it will launch. That's cool that it a level and it does. So there's some things that are happening here that are pretty neat, pretty worthwhile. Um, as it turns out, Visual Studio is actually a very good web development IDE. So it's going to give you a lot of the advantages. We've seen autocomplete. We've seen all kinds of neat syntax checking and things like that. Uh, it recognizes all of the web languages. It, rep it recognizes a great many web frameworks. It does a lot for you, so it's really nice as a web application platform as well. So this is all the stuff that we got when we created our project, and this is a lot of stuff. So what we got was, uh, let me turn off this, because I'm never going to use this again, right? <laughs> as soon as I get home, I'm turning on Chrome, and that will be the end of it. Anyway, we've got this navigation bar across the top. Um, we've got, didn't have to make anything. We've already got a login capability. Uh, we've got a registration capability. Now we don't have a database behind it, so if you if you were to play around with this and register, it would likely go into some, some sort of file-based database uh, in the app data folder, but you can mock up everything here and then later on you could add a different authentication provider or a database behind it, and it would work great. You could just, you, it's very good at, okay, well you can play with the little thing and then move it to SQL Server, which would be the big thing. Um, and of course you can customize all this. But we have all of these different pages here already for us, and all we have to do is go in and modify them. Okay, so just like before, if you quit the browser while you're debugging, it will take you out of debugging mode, which you can see by the bar at the bottom being blue now. And if we want to go in and change something, we need only find it. <laughs> um, it's a model view controller. Setup, so views, everything that you can see is in the views. The models are going to be your objects, 
and the controllers are going to control what you actually see. So let's just play with a view real quick since that's pretty straightforward. So let's open up home and let's open up let's see if we can change index CSHTML now you may not have heard of CSHTML before that's because it pretty much only exists in Microsoft land so this is a new thing that they have come up with over the last few years and uh, it's called the Razor templating system and what this is is basically all of the stuff that you're seeing um, that you got automatically so you've got some things in here uh, that make up Razor. So this Jumbotron thing, this comes from Bootstrap, which is a JavaScript um, UI framework. There are some other things that you can do. Let me see if there's a good example in here. Yes, there is, if I can get up there. <laughs> Let me zoom out. You go up to the top, you'll see something that is most distinctively not HTML. So this stuff up here at the top with the curly braces, and now inside these curly braces we have what? C-sharp code. So you can write C-sharp code in here, and it will recognize and work with it, though that's not the best place to put your C-sharp code. So let's just change something um, in, in here where it says ASP.NET. Let me see if I can roll this up. We can give that a go, see how that looks. So you get the idea. Now it's just down to HTML development for the UI. And then the back end part of it is usually going to be in the controllers. So again, we can't make this a web development class, which is too bad because that's 99% of what I do. What's your question? All I did to do that was I clicked the green button here that says Internet Explorer on it. Oh, that means you're in the wrong project. So for that, find Pancake Web over here and right click it and click the set as startup project. And that should cause that button to change so that it reads Internet Explorer. You get it? Okay. I'm going to run this one more time so I can point something out to you that may not be directly obvious and that is the URL that it's using so the URL is localhost but what's that number after it? The port. that's the port number so Visual Studio has its own web server built into it it's called, actually I think they may have changed it, it used to be called Cassini now I think it's just IIS Express, so IIS is Windows um, web server, Internet Information Services. And it's built into Windows professional or higher. So if you have any professional edition of Windows, you can install a real version of IIS for free if only you have your installation disks, usually are required. So did they get rid of that master file? No, they're there. I think. Uh, maybe they did. That, that used to be called a master page. And I think they did. I think that's what Razor replaces, come to think of it. Yeah, I guess they did. I don't spend a whole lot of time in here. <laughs> Let's see, what was I going to show you? Come up here. There it is. Yeah, let's do that. Let me just put my windows up here real quick. There we go. 
Okay, now we can find things a little easier. Okay, so if I go into Control Panel, I'll show you how to install some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Windows 8. I'm sorry, it's not going away. <laughs> Everyone at work is like, I'll never use Windows 8. Well, it's like, well, they're getting rid of Windows 7 like in two months. So, <laughs> yeah, I think you will eventually. <laughs> is 10 different? I have the, I have the download, but I haven't looked at it yet. Weird. Well, yeah, everybody hated Vista too, right? <laughs> it did go away though. It didn't have security. Yeah, it had that GAC thing. That was my problem. Then they fixed, and I was okay. Yeah. Right. It was a disaster. Every ten years, Microsoft releases a disaster. <laughs> All right, so what was I showing you? I was showing you features. Okay, so if you go in your control panel, this works in 7 or 8. It might look a little different, but if you go in and say, turn Windows features on or off, then you can configure the features that are on Windows. And there's two things that are worth noting here. Um, if you're doing it, well, there's three things, really. If you're doing older work, um, you might want to turn on .NET Framework 3.5 if you're doing older stuff. But if you want your own web server, independent of Visual Studio, you can just turn this on right here. So here it is, Internet Information Services. You turn that on. You can come down here and make a few more selections. Generally, you want the IIS Management Console, which is picked for you automatically. Generally, you want Application Development Features. You're definitely going to want to turn that on for your ASP.NET 4.5 so that your stuff actually runs outside of Visual Studio. And then I usually turn on WebSocket Protocol because that's a new and cool thing that lets you do things like long posts, useful things. So you turn that on. The other thing worth mentioning is Hyper-V. So Hyper-V is Microsoft's virtual machine technology. So I probably don't have to explain virtual machine since you're looking at one right now, right? So I'm on a, window, I'm on a Mac, but I'm running a Windows computer here as a virtual machine. So that's exactly what it lets you do. You can create a virtual machine and run operating systems in there. Very useful for testing. I don't know how useful it is for testing games. Um, it would be worth looking at. You could probably do simple testing uh, because your performance on a VM is never going to be as good as it is on a real machine. But it, it should be good enough to do simple testing. But for regular applications, it's you really have to have this. The real question is, can you run a virtual machine within a virtual machine? Yeah, you can. <laughs> in fact, you have to. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if I were to make a Windows Store application in here, VM section. <laughs> it, it uses, it uses Hyper-V to emulate Windows phones, um, iOS, Android, things like that. So yeah, it has. it's using that. Now what you'll run into problems with is if you want to use VMware and also use Hyper-V, you can't do that. It won't let you. In fact, VMware will not install if Hyper-V is turned on, which is a bummer. <laughs> because really, VMware is pretty good. Uh, Hyper-V is second to worst in my opinion. <laughs> It may actually be worse, the worst, the worst. Okay, so that's web applications. Um, again, we don't have time to go into the whole model view controller thing, but it's, as you can see, and really the point of this exercise is to show you you can make pretty much any kind of application that you want to make, you can make it in Visual Studio. What is it? How does it integrate with Photoshop? Well, sure. And can you do all that cool stuff like you can in some of the other tools? No, it doesn't. Uh, if you want to do that, you can either export it. Of course, you probably know you can export it in Photoshop. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you can pull it into Dreamweaver if you have Dreamweaver. Mm -hmm. If you don't have Dreamweaver, go get brackets. So this is an open source IDE for websites. And it does feature, and it's created by Adobe, so it shouldn't surprise you, that it does feature integration into Photoshop. So you can pull your comps in. Um, there's some stuff you have to do to it, but you can do it, as the nice little banner here indicates. So that's a possibility as well. I enjoy it. I just got it yesterday. So far, I, I've liked it a lot. No. No, it's just for websites. So HTML, JavaScript, CSS, less, SAS, TypeScript. It probably recognizes PHP, but it's a text editor. It's not an IDE. So for that, you'd have to go with PHP Storm. Which is what I use for my PHP work. Worth every penny. Okay. Any questions so far? Comments, snide remarks? Nothing? No, that's still there because that's where you still where you put all your stuff. So it's here. Oh, I see. I thought you meant this right here. Yeah, this is still where you put all your images and your CSS and stuff like that. Oh, I meant like the yeah, right. Well, I don't know that that was a bad thing. <laughs> I still have an application like that. So that was MVC 3. Still had all that master page stuff in it. It does. It's a lot nicer. They've made great strides to make this much better. So if you look at the evolution, Windows Forms, horrible. <laughs> this stuff, I think it's a little bloated. Uh, I made an application, started a brand new application today, and I went with empty <laughs> and pulled a, an Angular template in so that I would just have that. I wouldn't have all this extra stuff that I don't want. So all of that's possible, um, which is another great segue into what I can show you next. So if, whoops, did I click the right one? Yes, I did. So if last week was the nickel tour, this is the $25 tour. You're going to get all of it this time. OK. I'm going to switch back over. Which one should I do? Now nah, we'll leave it here for just a minute. The thing I was going to show you next are Visual Studio extensions. So if you go to Tools, and go to NuGet Package Manager, and then go to Manage NuGet Packages for Solution. Has anyone ever used Linux before? Specifically Debian, Ubuntu, any of the good ones? Define use. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever installed something using apt-get install? Yes. OK. apt-get install comes to Windows. Oh, boy. <laughs> Except it's really geared towards programming packages. So these are third-party tools, libraries. In this case, it's just tools, things that you want to add to your program. And there's thousands and thousands of them. So beware that this is here. You can come out and add things. Like uh, in this case, I don't know that we have Modernizer, but let's just pretend that we care what Modernizer is. Uh, I guess it is there because it says Manage instead of Get It. Let's see if I can find something that isn't in there. I know that's in there. Let's see what Antler is. OK, that's perfect. That'll work. So let's say we're going to use Antler. Not that you ever would, but let's say you were going to. Click Manage, and you can click which of your projects you want to add it to. So just for fun, let's add it to our console app and our web app. I'll click that. It's going to come down. Apparently, it was already installed, which is horrifying as far as I'm concerned. And they put it in to 
the ones where it wasn't. So I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it was in web and it wasn't in console because now we have this references section. So let's go look and now we can see all the stuff that it added. So there's the antler runtime. So antler is, in case you're, you're wondering, it's a language processing tool get from Linux. And it's got the kind of grammar in it that only a regular expressions geek can love. So uh, that's why it never gets used. <laughs> Except apparently somewhere in the bowels of Microsoft's web application, it's there. It's like hide under the carpet. Exactly. That literally is the monster living in your closet. <laughs> Somebody else has already figured it out. In other words, I'm sorry. Yeah, probably the most famous JavaScript developer alive right now is uh, Doug Crockford. He's the lead architect over, I think he's over at Yahoo. I could be wrong. Anyone listening to this online, please don't come to my house. Um, <laughs> if I got it wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> Crockford is, is sort of venerated as the Yoda of JavaScript programming right now. And um, he has some pretty strong opinions on regular expressions, which match my own. He, he basically says you should never use them because when you look at regular expressions, they're so terse that you can't, I mean, it takes a special kind of brain to look at that and go, oh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I prefer, and what I'll teach you is, I want you to write code that anybody with a C-sharp background that is, you know, you have to assume a certain base knowledge but assuming a base knowledge, uh, they ought to be able to look at your code and know what it's doing. They shouldn't have to sit there and think about it for 20 seconds to figure out what's happening there. So if you can write code that looks like that, then you'll, you'll be a lot more successful. Um, and I'll give you the horror story from my, uh, my, current, my current job position. Uh, I inherited a large application, a, ver a very large complicated application from another team of developers. Actually, it was one guy. And he went out of his way to make everything more complicated than it needs to be. Um, so he's the exact opposite. He's my anti, my anti pattern. So I, I think I sit at work and I, I think to myself, what would, what would I'm not going to say his name because this is going to go on YouTube later, and I don't want him coming to my house. <laughs> what would so and so do? And I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> so at, at some point, I may bring some of that in so you can look at it and I can show you how not to write code. Uh, because it's really, really bad. It's like he got a textbook on all the all the patterns and abstraction and all the stuff that you learn in a graduate level object-oriented um, design course, and it just sort of exploded, had kids, and then threw up all over the inside <laughs> of an IE. Um, it just drives us crazy. We have six layers of abstraction between where something goes into... Uh, our application from the web to where it actually goes to the database and really you need exactly one so the other five are really just him trying to be to look smart so it was, it was horrible so um, this is something that happens to developers in the middle of their career so when you first start out you're a developer you don't know what's going on and you're you're you know you're running 90 miles an hour just trying to figure out what you're doing most of the time and Google is your best friend and you probably do a lot of, of, of this, although I don't recommend it. You copy and paste things that you don't fully understand, and that's usually a bad thing. You should probably try to work to figure out what that's doing before you just throw it into your application. Um, but it's done, and it's done all the time. And you know, that's, I think that's part of the normal learning process, especially when you have a boss breathing down your neck saying you have to ship tomorrow. <laughs> and that's where a lot of that happens. Um, and then you get a little bit of knowledge under your belt, and then you start trying to be clever. And this is where you start shooting yourself in the foot. So you, you create all of this clever code and code that generates other code and <laughs> code that reads from generated configuration files that were generated from another generator, um, which you downloaded in, in this generator. <laughs> and it's very, very, very clever. <laughs> but it's not very useful. And then you get past that after you've shot yourself in the foot a few times and you can't walk right anymore. Um, then you start realizing that simple is better. So I'm going to lecture a lot and try to save you self-inflicted foot injuries and explain to you that the simplest, the simplest thing is always the best thing. Unless the complicated thing makes it go faster and then you have to do the complicated thing. Sorry. But then you comment a lot.
and it's okay. <laughs> yeah, you should avoid them if you can. When you research your thing it's cool and you try and use it and you just you find yourself out of place and you're like, how'd I get here? And sometimes there's just, I mean, that is the best thing. If you want to do something complicated like you want to validate an email address, which has a lot of moving parts to it, well, you'd have to write 100 lines of code to do it outside of regular expressions. So um, that's something that's tried and true. Go find the one that, in fact, Microsoft will give them to you. You right-click, say, use the regular expression for that, and it's, it's built in most of the time. So that stuff, go for it, man. That's, that's fine. Okay, next thing I want to show you is the most useful thing that I have shown you so far. Now that you're on the edge of your seat, let's right click. We're going to create one more kind of project. So we'll select Add, New Project, find a Visual C Sharp, and find the one that says Class Library. Now for this exercise, we're going to pick the first one. Don't pick the portable one. Pick the regular one. And we will call this one Pancake. Pancake House? Okay. I'm going to call mine live, but you can call yours House. come from a, that's bizarre that must be yeah I've never seen that in my life <laughs> no <laughs> don't do that again that's dumb I, I there's nothing in it how can it be a security risk it's I think it was wondering about the I think it downloaded the template from the from the internet really quickly. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Okay. <laughs> I was waiting. <clears throat> Patiently. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I just went ahead and closed that. In fact, I'm going to close all of this stuff because I don't want you to get confused. So I'm going to select close all documents and it'll shut everything down and now there is no question which one we're dealing with so it created for me when I made this project it created something called class 1 which I'm now going to delete I don't need it now I could change it but that's more frankly in my mind that's more work than it's worth let's create a class, and let's walk through a few of our basics so that we can remember our basics. So for this one, I'm in the Lib project. I'm going to right-click, and I'm going to come down here to the bottom, and I'm going to select Class. Now, one thing I want to point out. This is different than what you've been clicking before, right? Before you were clicking on, if I can get up there, the solution. Right-click the solution and click Add. You have a different set. This is talking about adding projects. If you do the same right click from within a project, now you're adding stuff that's project level. So new item, it's going to be a folder, it's going to be a graphic, it's going to be something. Uh, we're going to do a class. And let me zoom out. Okay, so these are all the items, the kinds of items that you can add to your project. Not the same thing as adding a project. This is a thing inside a project. And I'm going to come down here to the bottom, if I can make it down there with my funky zoom thing here. And I'm going to change the name of my class to, what should we call this? How about we uh, start thinking about our Dungeons and Dragons assignment and we will make a character class. So you can put .cs at the end or not. It's up to you. If you leave it off, it will put it on there for you. I put it on there because not all tools do. 
Okay, who can tell me what a class is? Blueprint. It's a blueprint for an object, right? So what kind of, what style of programming are we, are we using here with C-sharp? Object-oriented. Object and what is its antithesis? Do you remember? Procedural. Procedural, exactly. So there are a couple of different programming paradigms, but the two that you hear the most about are object-oriented and procedural. They're just two different ways of approaching the same kinds of problems. Many people will tell you that object-oriented is better. It's not. It's just different. And it's usually college professors, and it's usually old college professors with beards. <laughs> exactly. Back in I, my day, when we used Ada and Smalltalk. <laughs> right. It's not. In fact, procedural programming is making a resurgence. Um, there is a nice little procedural language on here if you wanted to play around with one. We don't really have time to go into it. And frankly, I've never used it, so <laughs> I can't really help you here. Um, but if you come in here and look at the F-sharp language, the F-sharp language is procedural rather than object-oriented. That is the extent of my knowledge on F-sharp, having only watched a few videos on it. It's because they couldn't use any abstracts after the app. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so this is a blueprint as Micah so aptly pointed out, for an object. So the thing about object-oriented programming that makes it different from procedural programming is that you have data in the form of variables and you have functions which in object-oriented world are called methods and they're, they're within the same structure. So you have data and things that work on data in the same structure. And structure just means the class in this case. I'm trying to pick a generic word that doesn't mean anything. Can't say object, can't, I, could call, I guess I could call it a thing, but that doesn't sound as erudite. Okay, so let's make a class, and then let's kind of pick it apart. So this is a character class. Every character has to have a name. So what kind of information is a name? It's a string, right? There's three basic kinds of information in the whole wide world. There are really only three. Actually, there's four. But there are three that we care about at this exact moment in time. Strings, which are alphanumeric characters, right? So anything that you can type on a keyboard is a string. The second kind would be numbers. And there are breakdowns of different kinds of numbers, but for now we can just say numbers. And then the third kind is, or I should say, Boolean. And that's just true or false. So we'll, we'll put examples of each kind in here so that we can take a look at each of them. So we're going to call this a string. Actually, we're going to put something in front of this. It's going to say public string. And I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to do this. So I'm going to show you the C-sharp way, which is the way that you should be using in this class, meaning this class and this class. <laughs> and then I'll show you the Java way so that you can see the two different ways. Yes? Oh, well, yes. Uh, well, technically, no. Um, they're po they point to the same thing. I have to be careful with the word point because that means something to the C people. <laughs> but generally, you want to use the lowercase one. They're trying to accommodate Java people. Which brings up a good point. I'm glad you asked that. Um, this language is case sensitive. So uppercase, lowercase matters. So you have to get uppercase, lowercase right. Okay, public string, and we'll call it a name. And we'll say get set. Wow. What does all that mean? Well, let me show you. This is what we call syntactic sugar. Okay, so when you put two bars like that, your, your line of code turns green, and this is called a comment. Comments are ignored. And they're used for documentation. You can also do long comments. 
like so. Was C sharp actually used in the asterisk on C prime before? No, it just puts it in there. You can get rid of them if you want to. And then the other kind of comment that you're going to find are documentation comments, which is funny because Microsoft got rid of the framework used to generate documentation. But you can do three of them, and now you can do documentation comments. They do matter. They don't matter that much, though. So what this would do, and you can still buy products that will do this, and it's a good idea if you have you know, a budget for this sort of thing. Um, and it's really only useful if you have a lot of people that are going to be using your code, um, meaning other programmers, not users. So what you can do is you can run an application that will generate documentation for your classes. That's pretty awesome. We'll take a look at class documentation at other points during the course, but if you've taken the Unity course and you've looked at their class documentation, then you know what I'm talking about. They can automatically generate that stuff from the comments, which is great because you have the documentation and the code together. Although good luck getting any programmer to write documentation comments. It just doesn't happen. Or it should. <laughs> it should, but it doesn't. So one good measure of, co of code quality is you should expect at least 30% of your total lines of code to be documentation. Of course, that again, that never happens. Okay, so what does this thing mean? We've taken a little aside here. Let me show you how Java does it so you can kind of see the difference. And this is viable. You can do this in here as well. What should we say? We'll just say last name. You don't really have last names in Dungeons & Dragons characters, but you could. And actually, I want to change this from public to private. So I'm going to show you how they teach it over at UTD. It's going to look a little more like this. Okay, so before we get into all that other stuff, let's look at this public and private thing. In order to demonstrate what this does, I need another class. So let me go over to Pancake Live, right click, select Add, and let's add another class. And I'm just going to call this Runner. It's going to be temporary. We're not going to keep it. Blew myself up, didn't I here? Let's go to this. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Now to make this work, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some method. Let's say public void blah. <laughs> doesn't matter we're gonna get rid of this here in a minute and let's actually use the class that we created so let's say var my character equals new character bada boom so there's a big fancy word for what we just did it's called instantiation we've created an instance of our character object so remember when Micah said that the class character, the character class, a text file over there, is a blueprint. It is a blueprint, just like a blueprint for a house. I can make lots of houses from the same blueprint. I can make lots of object instances from one class. Oops. Oops, there we go. I can't spell worth a darn, can I? There we go. Oop. 
Yeah. <laughs> it is almost 9 o'clock. I think it's close enough. Plus or minus, right? Round, round up. <laughs> yeah. So there's two instances of our character class. These are completely independent of each other. We can change things on my character. Won't affect my other character at all. Right? Does that make sense? It's like um, two different houses. You can paint one of them red, but it won't affect the color of the other house. Okay, let's think about that public and private thing that we just saw. I'm going to access the methods and the properties that are on that class, just like we did a minute ago in our demonstration on forms. If we know the name of something and we hit dot, now we can see the properties that are available. What's the clue that it's a property again? The wrench, right? So you see that wrench and it says name. What's distinctly missing from this? Last name. Last name is not there. Why is that? Because it's, private. because it's private. So this is called an access modifier. I'm going to switch back over. I'll give it name so it's happy. That's a good question. This is also syntactic sugar. So the Java way, the old way, how about we do Java character? <laughs> Still valid, still legal, still fine. Here's the difference. If you say var, the compiler will figure out what you mean based on this right here. So this is called yeah, this is called implicit typing. Now the great thing about this is if you change this to something else, you don't have to change it over here. It's just going to figure it out based on what's over here. So this is called implicit typing. There is but one that I can think of, and it looks like this. Oops, that's supposed to be a question mark. You can use your imagination, right? <laughs> it's close enough. Okay, what's it guessing? What does it figure that is? It's an integer. Or maybe an unsigned integer. Maybe. Which one is it? It's going to assume it's an integer rather than an unsigned integer. Now what is it? <laughs> okay. Assuming... Did I do this right? Yeah, my number equals blah. Okay, I have no idea how long that, that's a long number. That's obviously not an integer. And I probably exceeded the limit of what I can actually do. That's a computationally ridiculous number. Um, if there is no place where this is assigned in the code, like I think what's the real, the real, the real limit is like four billion and change, right? So if you go above four billion and change, and you punch in, say, 10 billion. Okay, so it's going to tell me, hey, that, <laughs> what's it saying? 64-bit sign integer cannot implicitly convert type. So there's your explanation. It's telling you it can't. This is a long integer. And we'll get to what the difference between long is, but it's kind of easy to figure out, right? It's a bigger number. We'll talk about why those, those delineations exist later. But here it's implicitly guessing that this is an integer, and then it's finding out later that it's not. Okay, so this is actually not terrible because there is some place in the code where it could conceivably go figure out that it needs to be bigger than that. But what if you're allowing your users to enter that number and you didn't sanitize your input? Now you've got a crash, right? It's going to crash. That's 
That's a blue screen of death waiting to happen right there. So this is where you have to be careful with it. Anytime you do this where you have new, um, it's going to go, hey, great. Um, but here it's guessing that that's a, an integer and it's guessing probably wrong. Even if you did this, um, oops, already declared it. So if I do my number, okay, now what's the problem? <laughs> that's a floating point number now, isn't it? So I didn't tell it. Now if you're a Unity guy, you know, or girl, you know, you can type an F there. And now it knows it's a float, but it's still confused. So that's where it's going to get you in trouble. Lowercase. So that's the problem with implicit typing. But anytime you're using it with the new keyword, you should go ahead and use it. Because that's that's a slam dunk right now. You really can't get that wrong. Okay. So really, going back to where we were, public and private, the difference is visibility, right, between classes. So we go back and look over here. We've got, excuse me, we've got a public string which we can see and a private string that we can't see. So how is this exposed in the land of Java and bearded programming instructors? I'm so glad I shaved. It looks a little like this. We create a method, a set of methods really called accessor methods. Let me comment it so we have the name because that's bound to show up on a test sooner or later, right? Also known as getters and setters. But the real term is accessor methods. Getters and setters comes from, well, you'll see, pretty obvious. So public, whatever the type is, string, get last name, like so. Here's our getter. It's mad. The red underline is because we haven't returned a string yet. So let's do that. So, red line should go away. There's your getter. Here's your setter. So that's the Java way of doing it. It's sort of the universal way of doing it. Any object-oriented programming language should support something really similar to this. Getters and setters. Now if I switch back over to my runner, I still won't be able to see last name exposed because it's private, but I can see these two methods because they are public. This is called, there's a fancy name for this by the way, do you know what it is? For the setter? No, the whole practice of hiding that variable. Encapsulation. Encapsulation. Encapsulation is good, but it's often overkill. And I'll show you the overkill part here in just a minute. Now I can get to our setters, right? So we can set the last name. like so. Or we can get it
Okay, so you see how that works? You have methods called accessor methods. Now that's probably the last time you're ever going to do that in this class because we have nicer ways of doing it. That's the Java way. I call that the long way. There's a slightly better way. Now, what's the deal with this right here? Let me show you something else that's confusing to new students. Let's do middle name. Just like that. No get set, no nothing. No encapsulation at all. What's going to happen when I switch over to runner? Is it going to let me access it? Yes. Absolutely, it will. Why is that bad? Look you there. Completely legal, completely fine. Generally considered a bad practice, though. So here's why encapsulation exists. Let's try something a little different. Let's try a number this time. We'll say it's age. And we'll go back to the C sharp way, which has, well, let's, let's do it this way. Let's do no encapsulation so we can see the evil. <laughs> see the evil of no encapsulation. And I'll kind of put some spaces around it so it'll be easier to spot, right? OK. I have a quick question. What is it? If you were to, say, put um, uh, like the public screen or the public void set last one, you can put that anywhere in the class character, right? Yes. And the reason for that is because we're using a compiled language which has a linking step in it. You don't see that. You come up here and hit build. It's going to build it for you. And if you really watch these down here, you might get to see something that says linking, but probably not. But that's what a linker does. So if you've ever worked in JavaScript, you know that the order in which your functions are listed and your variables are listed matters. You shouldn't do a forward call, which means you can't call a function that hasn't been defined yet. But in a compiled language, you can because it's linked. It's got a link step in it. So that means there's a nice little database built into your executable that allows it to find the instructions regardless of where they are. Okay. Evils of not using encapsulation. Up here, would it really matter? No, it wouldn't. You can put anything you want in there. But can you put anything you want in here? I've switched back over to my runner class, and I'll say my character dot age equals in my dreams. And that's fine. That's right. That's how you would expect a programmer to interact with this, right? Except there's a whole class of programmers that are going to do this <laughs> because they can. <laughs> Is that right at all? No. How can we prevent this? There are two ways we can prevent this. Can you think of what they are? One of them is encapsulation. What's the other one? You could change your data type. To an unsigned integer. But then you've got like... <laughs> but now you can do... Like <laughs> now you can do up to 8 billion, right? Yeah. So you can say you're 8 <laughs> billion years old, which is actually older than the universe. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you could, but nobody does. That's a good question. Because that also keeps the memory space that you're using small because who's more than 255 years old? Right. And I'll tell you that's the right thing to do, and I'll also tell you that nobody does it. <laughs> so we'll look at bytes in a minute. Here's what I really want to show you though. So this is unencapsulated, right? So if we do this, if we add just the syntactic sugar, the standard one, like this, 
it's the same thing as just leaving it public right that there's no there's no difference this is where encapsulation is useful is when you actually put logic in your accessor methods and to do that it looks a little different so if you want to do them manually you can let me fix this up a little bit And we're going to get into a little trouble here in a minute <laughs> because I don't have a backing variable for this. So this is going to look a little more like the Java thing we just did. I'm going to, right above this, I'm going to make a private variable. This is called a backing variable of type, and the type has to match, so it has to be a uint, and that is type age. Now I'm using a, a convention. Private variables are generally, by convention, preceded by an underscore. And they start with a lowercase letter. That's a convention. You don't have to do that. There's nothing magical about the underscore. What this tells the programmers that are looking at your code is that, oh, that's a, that's a private variable. It's a convention. OK. There's our getter. There's nothing special about this. This is the exact same thing as what's up here. We just have some stuff in here that, that does the same thing that this does. So this is basically, leave it wide open, but we want to do encapsulation because we know encapsulation is good and it keeps the purists happy. In this case, we're going to do a little bit of logic here. So for our setter, we're going to say if value less than 120, Then we'll say age equals value. Where does value come from? Well, value is built into the language. That's a built-in keyword that you can use when you're doing your getters and setters. So it just assumes that whatever is passed in is going to be held in a variable called value. Okay, so that is a setter encapsulated that actually does some good in the world. It will prevent a programmer who's using your class from setting your value, your age, above 120, which according to Genesis is the maximum lifespan of a human, except for Moses who lived for 800 years. I'm not sure how that <laughs> happened. It's confusing. Okay, what happens if we set it higher than that? Nothing. What is age going to be? Zero. We will initialize it as zero. Now, a better thing to do, since we're all friends here, would be to throw an error. What is it? So I would be able to underscore age, um, and if I make public int age, I'll get the underscore age to be a red square. Whereas if I keep both of those to you in, then everything will find an error. I think I would have to look over your shoulder for that one. <laughs> well, my, my public int age, I, only, I have the public int, not you. OK, so you have a public int like this. Like that. Right. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't have two of them with, with the same name, even though they're different types. Well, if you change public view and age, then um, and you just have that alone, your bottom one. And change this one to what? Just take it, make it an int. And then take away public view and age that you have up there to bind up. Just make it all in, yeah. 
Oh, well, that's because here we have a uint and here we have an int. Those aren't compatible. So if we change this to an int, then it'll be fine. So because underscore age is referenced in the uh, in public in the function public age, uh, and it's using the uint, it doesn't like it because it's using a different um, type. type yeah. So you can think of these if you've ever seen those nesting dolls from Russia. There's got to be a picture, right? <laughs> it's in a way it behaves the same way as a function, right? Right. When it's returning a value, it has to be the same type as the as whatever it's trying to go in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I <have> no idea. <laughs> okay. Oh, look, and they're even they're even political. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. So, let's look at this for a minute. President Kennedy will fit inside of President Reagan, right? <laughs> and President Bush will fit inside of President Obama. All right, so let's think about this for a minute. Actually, this I don't see a difference in skin tone. Fascinating. All right, so how does this work? Let's. This is this is draw on the board time here for just a second.
parts of uh, for parts of Clinton for uh, parts, parts of, of Clinton. Clinton. I don't even want to say parts of Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> So does that mean like if you try to put an int in a, into a unit, would it truncate like it does with a float? They would just say no, you can't do that. But if you could take a value out and put it into a different variable, oh, okay, so up from there, um, just forget about numbers, we can use strings. So can... I'm so getting fired because all this is on tape. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just edit this out. That was pretty funny. I don't know. I might, I might get like a million YouTube hits off this thing. Okay. The problem is you don't know how the presentation recording, do you? Yeah. Everything. Uh, well, they can't see what I drew on the board. But you do have the screen. But everything that's on the screen oh, is okay. being recorded, so that's all good. Okay, so we did a lot tonight. We did a lot more than I thought we would. And um, at least one of you has admitted that she's lost, so that's fine. Um, if you're not lost yet, then I'll lose you it sooner or later. That's, that's normal. Uh, we'll go back and explain what all of this stuff means because it's now almost 9.30 time to go. And I can't explain all of this um, before we go home tonight. Uh, but I will. This is where we'll pick up next week. And I didn't even get to the really magical part, but that's okay. We really need to go through all of these basics because it seems like some of you have it and some of you don't. And I want to make sure everybody has it before we get into the really awesome stuff. So that's it. And I will take this code and put it up so that you can look at it if you want to. Um, Look for whatever your due date is for next week. I'm sure you have something to do. It's probably another paper, although a much easier one. Um, do we save this for another time? Or? No, you don't need to save it unless you really want to. Um, I am going to put this up so that you can get to it if you want to. And that's it for this week. I will see you next week where I promise I will make some of this clearer. <laughs> <laughs>